Hi everybody. In this unit we're continuing with asexual propagation and cuttings and we're going to look at the use of rooting compounds which can help speed up the production of adventitious roots. We'll also take a quick look at some other products which are also sometimes added to the substrate to improve rooting and at the end there's a short discussion of the pros and cons of adding fertilizer during the rooting process. By the end of this unit you'll be able to describe the main types of rooting compound and describe the main advantages and disadvantages of powder, liquid and gel formulations of rooting compounds. Plant hormones or phytohormones are substances that are synthesized by the plant and they trigger specific physiological responses in the plant such as the division, enlargement, and differentiation of cells into specific tissue types. The main groups of hormones found in plants are listed on the right. From a conventional propagation point of view, the most influential group of hormones involved in the production of adventitious roots in cuttings is the auxins. Auxins were the first category of plant hormone to be recognized back in the 1930s. The main naturally occurring auxin in plants is a compound called IAA, or indole acetic acid, which has several different roles in the plant, including inducing cell elongation, cell division, and root formation. A second auxin called IBA, indole butyric acid, is also produced in plants, but in smaller amounts than IAA. Natural auxins are produced in apical meristems of both shoots and roots and in the young leaf tissue and they move in a bicipital direction in the plant, meaning they move towards the crown of the plant. In the aerial parts of the plant, which are the parts above ground, this means auxins are generally moving in a downward direction. In the roots, it means they're generally moving in a more or less upwards direction. The production of IAA can be triggered by wounding, such as the action of us as propagators removing a stem from a plant when we want to prepare cuttings. IAA degrades quickly when it's exposed to light and is also metabolized quickly by plant tissues and by microorganisms. This lack of longevity is obviously a problem from a plant propagation point of view because we want the auxins to be present for quite a while in order to initiate roots. Not long after the auxins were recognized as plant hormones, two synthetic auxins were developed. One was NAA, naphthalene acetic acid, and the second was a synthetic form of the naturally occurring IBA. These two synthetic auxins were found to be more effective than the naturally occurring IAA in promoting adventitious root formation. They also have the advantages of not being as light sensitive as IAA and they don't break down as fast. In propagation, synthetic auxins are applied to cuttings to promote adventitious root formation. They're also sometimes used in layering techniques, which we'll talk about in another module. The plant response to these exogenous auxins isn't universal though and different strengths of rooting compound are required for different species and for different types of cutting. Some cuttings don't respond at all to the application of exogenous auxins, and these plants are often described as being recalcitrant. It's interesting to note that applied in large quantities, auxins can also be used as plant killers, as in the herbicide 2,4-D, pictured here on the right. There are several formulations of synthetic auxins that are available to propagators. Powders, alcohol-based liquids, gels, and soluble salts that are dissolved in water. Depending on the brand, these rooting compounds include either NAA or IBA, alone or in combination. Which rooting compound we choose depends on the crop we're working with, the required auxin strength to promote production of adventitious roots, the number of cuttings to be treated, cost and personal preference. 
depending on the species we're propagating, the application of a rooting compound isn't always necessary. However, it can speed up the rooting process and promote more uniform rooting, which can both compensate for the additional labour cost of applying rooting compounds. Rooting compounds are available in ready-to-use formulations in varying strengths, or they can be bought as concentrates and then diluted to the required strength. As propagators, we need to select the most appropriate strength for the crop being propagated. It's important to remember that using a higher strength or using more product than is necessary isn't always better because higher concentrations of auxins can inhibit root elongation. Let's take a closer look at the various formulations of rooting compound that are available to us. Rooting compound powders have the auxins mixed into a talcum powder base. They come ready mixed in a variety of strengths from 1000 parts per million for easy to root material to 30,000 parts per million for very hard to root material such as English yew and English holly. Powders are easy to use but they can blow around, so make sure you're using them in a draft-free space so you don't inhale any of the powder or get it into your eyes. One of the disadvantages of powders compared to liquids is that they're not in a form that's readily available to the plant. They have to dissolve first in water that's held in the substrate. If you like to work with a substrate that's fairly dry, you may find that the powder doesn't dissolve well and therefore isn't very available to the cutting. In this case, you may find a liquid or a gel rooting compound is more effective. When you're using a powder, a little goes a long way, so just empty a small amount into a shallow container. Unless you're sticking more than 1500 cuttings, there's probably no need to put more than half a teaspoon of powder on a plate or a small container. Never dip cutting material into the original container because you don't want to contaminate it. After preparing the cutting, dip the basal end into the powder, as shown in the photo in the top right hand corner here. Some propagators prefer to moisten the ends of the cuttings first, if they're not already moist, so that the powder sticks better. Some propagators also prefer to dibble a hole in the substrate before sticking the cutting so that the powder doesn't rub off. You then have to lightly backfill the hole around the base of the cutting, so this can be more labour intensive. When you're finished, never put unused product back into the original container, because it probably has contaminated plant material in it. Liquid rooting compounds are available as concentrates that are dissolved in an alcohol base, or as soluble salts that are dissolved in distilled water, or RO, which is reverse osmosis water. The most commonly available alcohol-based liquid is dip and grow, and the most widely used water-soluble salts are sold under the brand name Hortus. One of the main advantages of liquid concentrates is that you can mix them to the desired strength. You can't do this very easily with powders and gels. If you work with a variety of plant material that needs different strength rooting compounds, then liquids may be a better product than powders or gels, if you don't want to buy a complete range of different strength powders. One of the other main advantages of liquid rooting compounds is that they're immediately available for uptake by the cutting. Also, their distribution on the base of cuttings can be more uniform than a powder. Alcohol-based liquids can act as a surface sterilant, which is a good thing, although there are some reports that the alcohol can burn very soft herbaceous material. The main disadvantage of liquid rooting compounds is that they have to be mixed. This adds another step to the labour process and can be a source of error if the person doing the mixing doesn't prepare the appropriate strength. The other drawback to the alcohol-based liquids is that they're not strong enough for some of the particularly hard to root cuttings, such as the trees English holly and English yew, which need about 30,000 parts per million of IBA whereas the maximum strength of alcohol-based rooting compounds, such as dip and grow or woods rooting compound, is usually only around 15,000 parts per million. For these particularly hard to root species, you'll need to use Hormex number 30, a powder formulation, or the Hortus water-soluble potassium salts of IBA, 
which can be used to obtain solutions that contain up to 100,000 parts per million of IBA. Always prepare your liquid rooting compound before you prepare your cuttings so that you can dip them and plant them as quickly as possible once they're prepared. Usually you dip the bottom half inch or a little more on cuttings that are longer into the liquid for between one and five seconds. You then stick the cutting immediately and there's no need usually to dibble a hole. You can usually dip several cuttings at once depending on the size of the container that you've got the liquid rooting compound in and this can really speed up the sticking process. Gels are semi-solid products, usually in a cellulose space, and they stick to whichever plant part they're applied to. Commonly available brands include Clonex and Dynagro. An advantage of gels is that, like powders, no mixing is involved. They're ready to use, and unlike the powders, there's no loose powder to blow around. Some manufacturers of gels claim that the gel forms a protective covering against pathogens around the wounded area at the base of a cutting, but I can't find any scientific research that backs up these claims. One of the disadvantages of gels is that you can't change the strength. Given that the auxin strength is relatively weak in these products, you're limited to using them for material that roots fairly easily. I've also found that the gel can slide up the stem of the cutting when you're sticking it, so you may need to dibble a hole first, which of course is an additional labour step, and then you need to press the substrate back around the base of the cutting. Synthetic auxins are less sensitive to light than natural endogenous auxins produced in the plant, but they should still be stored in a place that's dark and preferably cool. Liquid concentrates can be stored in the fridge. Powder-based products can also be stored in the fridge, but make sure they're in a waterproof container. Gel-based products can also be stored in the fridge. The concentration of alcohol-based liquids that have been mixed with water for use can change as the alcohol evaporates. So it's best to mix fresh batches of rooting compound each day and not to put used batches of rooting compound back in the fridge to use again the following day. Always check the instructions on the original container label for storage conditions recommended by the manufacturer. Also, always read the label to see what personal protective equipment is required. Alcohol-based concentrates like Dip and Grow and Woods rooting compound are yellowish in colour and it's normal for them to darken over time. So don't be surprised if you see a change in color. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the product. As far as I'm aware, none of the commonly available commercial rooting compounds are approved for use in organic production. Online, you can find many different recipes for making homemade so-called organic rooting promoters. And two of the most common substances are willow tea and honey. Willow extract solutions are made from stems of willow trees, which are species of salix. The plant hormone salicylic acid is present in willows, which is what aspirin is derived from. It's been shown that salicylic acid can enhance rooting when it's used in combination with auxins. Therefore, it's possible that if the plant being propagated has sufficient endogenous auxins of its own, then applying willow tea to water in the cuttings might enhance rooting. I can't find any scientific research at the moment though that's been done to confirm this effect. Some websites claim that auxins as well as salicylic acid are leached out of willow while making willow tea. Remember though that IAA is light sensitive, so personally I'd be surprised if it were effective for long enough to have a beneficial impact on the rooting of cuttings dipped in willow tea. It's also not possible to calculate the amount of auxin present in willow tea unless you have a very sophisticated chemistry lab. In short, treat online claims of the efficacy of willow tea as questionable unless you can find science-based data to back it up.
Honey is also claimed on some websites to enhance rooting. Honey does have some anti antimicrobial properties, so it's possible that it may protect the cut end of the cutting from pathogens. There are also some other products that are used in the substrate in asexual propagation. Some growers add mycorrhizal products such as Root Shield or Root Shield Plus to the propagation substrate. Root Shield contains a strain of the fungus Trichoderma harzianum, which is active against soil-borne pathogens. Root Shield Plus contains strains of both Trichoderma harzianum and Trichoderma virens. There's also some evidence that mycorrhizal products may enhance root growth and root development after adventitious roots have emerged on cuttings. Amino acid products and other products labeled as biostimulants claim to promote root growth, but evaluate these claims carefully and carry out your own research before adding the cost of these products to any, pro um, to any production program. As many of these products contain beneficial microorganisms, make sure you check they're compatible with any pesticides you may be using. Otherwise, you may just be applying expensive products for nothing because you'll be killing the beneficials with the pesticides, possibly. Many cuttings are rooted under a mist system, which can leach nutrients out of cuttings. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium and magnesium are the nutrients which are leached out. And leafy hardwood cuttings are more prone to nutrient leaching than younger softwood and herbaceous cuttings. Nutrient deficiencies in cuttings aren't usually a problem when we're rooting easy and moderately easy to root cuttings, provided we took the cuttings from healthy mother stock that wasn't nutrient stressed. Usually these easy and moderately easy to root cuttings are ready to transplant before nutrient deficiencies become a problem and we can then include nutrients in the medium that they're transplanted into. Nutrient stress resulting from leaching can be a problem with cuttings which take longer to root though. Some growers apply a weak nutrient solution through the mist system as a foliar feed, but you need to be careful doing this. Firstly, applying nutrients to cuttings can inhibit rooting. And secondly, it can promote the growth of algae. Algae growth can cause hygiene problems. Fungus gnats lay their eggs in algae, and when the larvae hatch, they feed on young adventitious roots or on the plant tissue at the base of the cutting, which then provides entry for secondary pathogens such as the water molds, Pythium and Phytophthora, and the fungal pathogen Rhizoctonia. A coating of algae or green slime on the top of wet propagation media can also cause media aeration problems by reducing the supply of oxygen to the rooting zone. One solution to nutrient leaching is to reduce the frequency of misting, but this can also reduce humidity, which in turn can stress cuttings by leading to increased water loss. Successful propagation really is a delicate juggling act between maintaining healthy plant material, appropriate environmental conditions, and promoting germination in seeds and rooting in cuttings before the pathogens move in. And finally, let's summarize the material covered in this unit. Plant hormones are substances synthesized by the plant that trigger specific physiological responses. The plant hormones that are the most influential in the production of adventitious roots are the auxins. Auxins are produced in apical meristems in shoots and roots and in young leaves, and they move in a bicipital direction in the plant. Synthetic auxins have been developed, which are widely used in propagation to promote the production of adventitious roots. They are applied exogenously to the wounded area of a cutting or a layer. There are several formulations of synthetic auxins available to propagators. We have powders, liquids, gels, and soluble salts. These products contain either NAA or IBA alone or in combination. The propagator's choice of rooting compound depends on the crop, the required rate, 
the number of cuttings to be treated, the cost and the grower preference. Rooting compounds should always be stored in a cool, dark, dry environment. In order to avoid contamination, don't put unused product back into the original container and don't dip plant material into the original container. Commercial rooting compounds are not approved for use in organic production. There are many reports online advocating the efficacy of willow extract, honey and other natural products too as rooting enhancers. But there is no definitive scientific research proving the benefit or mode of action of these products. Some growers add mycorrhizal products such as root shield or root shield plus to substrates used for propagation. These products can be effective against soilborne pathogens and there is anecdotal evidence too that they may also pr promote root development once adventitious roots have emerged. Nutrients are not usually added to substrates used in asexual propagation and nutrient stress is not usually a problem if the cuttings have been collected from healthy mother plants. Leaching of nutrients under a mist system can be a problem with cuttings that take longer to root. In these cases, a weak nutrient solution can be applied as a foliar spray, but care should be taken that it doesn't promote algal growth. That's the end of this unit on rooting compounds, and we'll talk about them a little more in upcoming units on the rooting of stem cuttings, leaf cuttings, leaf bud cuttings, and on layering.